Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seattle International Association for Near-Death Studies. Acronym is Seattle IANDS, I-A-N-D-S. My name is Kimberly Clark Sharp. I had the great honor of founding this organization along with, rest in peace, a woman named Betty Preston in June of 1982. So uh, we have been at this quite a while and happily and gratefully remain vigorous and uh, super active with a lot of attendees. And I'd like to uh, get into the uh, uh, agenda. Uh, my, my name is Robert Baer. I'm the vice president of Spiritual Awakenings International and also one of the co-founders. And it is my honor to uh, be here in front of the Seattle Lions uh, group and co-sponsor this event on behalf of SAI. And for those of you that don't know about us, we are a new organization. We uh, launched in, on June 15th of this year, and we are already in 38 countries, six continents, and we have 25 affiliated groups. Like we're gonna have two more here very shortly. So we'll be up to 27 affiliated groups with over 800 subscribers. And we'd like to have you take a little look at www.spiritualawakeningsinternational.org when, when you get an opportunity. Just wanted to say that. Now, Dr. Yvonne Kaysan is, is of course, one of the co-founders of SAI. And um, she's the president of the organization. And she is a family physician and transpersonal psychotherapist. She's retired. She was previously on the faculty at the University of Toronto. She is an internationally renowned medical expert on near-death uh, studies. And she became the first Canadian doctor, medical doctor, to specialize her medical practice in the research and counseling of patients with diverse types of STEs. And Dr. Kaysan is the person who coined the phrase spiritually transformative experiences, which are STEs, in 1994 in her book, A Farther Shore. She has had five near death experiences herself two in her childhood and three in her adult life, as well as multiple STEs. Dr. Kaysan is also the past president of IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and a former IONS board member. She is the co-leader and co-founder of Toronto Awakening Sharing Group and is a member of ASSIST, the American Center for Inter Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. Dr. Kaysan has been a pioneer in the field of STEs for over 40 years. In 1990, she co-founded them and later became a longtime board member of the Kundalini Research Network. She was also the, Can the Canadian co-founder of the Spiritual Emergence Network. And in 1992, the founder of the Spiritual Emergence Research and Referral Clinic in Toronto. In 2000, she co-founded the Spiritually in Health Care Network, and in 2002, she was chair of the University of Toronto's first ever conference on spirituality and health care. She's published five books, her most recent, Touched by the Light, Exploring Spiritually Transformative Experiences, is, is now available in bookstores. And she has had extensive media and public speaking experience worldwide been a keynote speaker, several conferences. He's been invited, uh, a invited guest on many TV talk shows, including the Dr. Oz show and radio shows, including Coast to Coast. And her 1979 plane crash, near death experience was reenacted on sightings and in two documentaries. Dr. Kaysan herself has been honored for her groundbreaking STE work as an honoree on the Spiritual Awakenings International Circle of Honor. And with that, please welcome Dr. Yvonne Kaysan. 
Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really my honor to speak to Seattle IANS today and have the opportunity to also um, have Spiritual Awakenings International co-sponsor this event. So thank you, Kimberly, for inviting me. Um, my topic today is everything you want to know about near-death experiences. And Kimberly told me right before I started, gee, we talk about that every day at the beginning of our meetings, <laughs> every month at the beginning of our meetings. I thought, oh my goodness. Well, hopefully you're all going to learn something new from me today in terms of what is the newest that we now know about near-death experiences after 40 years of research. But Kimberly also asked me to share some of my personal experiences. So what I plan to do is for the first half of today's presentation, I'm going to be telling you my own personal story. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the near-death experiences and STEs that um, changed the course of my life forever. And then in the last half of the presentation, I'll do some screen sharing and I'll share with you my synopsis of what I've learned about near-death experiences in 40 years of research. So everything you need to know about near-death experiences. So how did I, as a medical doctor, first get interested in this field? Because you might think this is very unusual for a medical doctor to specialize in NDEs and STEs, which it is, <laughs> and particularly back in 1990 when I did that. Well, how did I get into that? Well, how it all started was when I was in medical school. When I was in my last year of medical school, there was a meditation course that was being offered at the, at the university. I was at McMaster University in Hamilton. And I took this meditation course. They advertised it saying that it would help you do better on exams because if you meditated, you would be more relaxed and you'd study better, you'd perform better. So I took this course hoping it would help me with my exam performance, which it, it did. I did very well in my exams, but I discovered that I really loved meditating and it felt very comfortable to me. I felt like I was a duck being reintroduced to water. It was a fit. So I started meditating for an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening every day and just loved it. After about three months of meditation, I was in a large group meditation and all of a sudden I had what I now know was a kundalini awakening. But back then I had no idea what it was. All of a sudden I heard this loud inner roaring noise, like the roar of a waterfalls. And I felt this powerful energy like <sighs> go rushing up my body and out through the top of my head. And then all of a sudden I found myself maybe 20 or 30 feet above my body and I expanded, like what I think of of me was no longer the size of like my head or my body, but I expanded to fill this vast space. And then I felt this really beautiful sensation of joy and love. And I remember thinking, wow, no wonder people like to meditate because I didn't know any better. I thought all the other experienced meditators were having this experience every time they meditated and that I was finally like having the it experience. I'd finally gotten my technique right. And so I didn't even tell anybody for a long time that this had happened to me because I was confused and a little embarrassed that it wasn't happening to me other times when I meditated afterwards. Um, and so anyway, I was in medical school. I didn't know what to think of this. I was having after effects, you know, rushes of energy up my spine, uh, but I just sort of put it aside because I was focusing on my medical studies. But that was my first sort of introduction to STEs personally. Then when I was in my last year of residency training, I already was a young doctor and I was doing my residency in family medicine. I was assigned to Northern Ontario in winter to work at a small remote hospital there. And um, I was sent on a medevac by airplane. And that day I had my first adult near-death experience. Now I know it's a near-death experience, but back then I had no idea what it was. So this was in the last year of my residency. So let me tell you what happened to me that day. 
So we were in this small twin engine airplane doing um, this medevac, this medical evacuation. There was a, it was a small in, a plane called the Piper Aztec, if people know what these type of planes look like, two wind propeller plane, very small. There was the pilot on the co-pilot seats was an oxygen tank. The patient was on her stretcher behind the pilot and the, I was behind the co-pilot seat. The nurse was behind me and the plane was full. That was the whole plane. That was how small this plane was. So anyway, the patient was intubated, which meant she had an airway into her lungs and I had to be pumping this bag to keep oxygen going into her lungs. And the nurse was tending to her intravenouses. She had two drugs going in, two intravenouses. Anyway, I was paying attention to the patient. I wasn't really watching what was happening outside the plane, but we flew into bad weather. We flew into a blizzard and then one propeller suddenly stopped. And I remember hollering up to the pilot, what's happening, what's happening, what's going on? And he was pushing levers and doing things. And, you know, obviously he was desperately trying to get the engine going again, which he did. He got the one engine going, but then the other engine stopped a few minutes later, the one engine on the other side stopped. Later when they did the inquest, they assuming that the, the snow from the blizzard had frozen up the ice filters from the engines, which was why they were, were, were failing. So, so now that engine had stopped and then all of a sudden the left engine stopped. So we were with no engines. Okay, we were with no engines, we're in a storm and we started going down very rapidly. My first reaction was intense fear and panic. I remember just intense, because it was really clear we were crashing. And what happened was it was like a reflex out of my heart, it just came out of my heart. Oh God, help, I'm gonna die. And it seems like that plea out of my heart was close enough to a prayer because that is when my near death experience started before the plane had actually crashed while the plane was still going down. And what happened was all of a sudden, it was like this force field of peace descended upon me. And it was literally pushing away all of my fear and I felt peaceful and I felt calm and my fear was gone and then I heard a voice in my mind say be still and know that I am God I am with you now and always. And with those words, there was such a spiritual vibration that just permeated through me. I was still alert. I was still conscious. The plane had not crashed yet. I turned and I started comforting the patient. She, was, she had regained consciousness and we turned off the oxygen. And I remained in this incredible paranormal state of peace and calm and feeling a higher presence. The, the pilot really, really heroically and bravely guided the free falling plane and steered it to do sort of a belly crash landing onto the surface of a frozen lake, avoiding crashing into the trees because we're in Northern Ontario, it's all forested. So if we had crashed in the trees, we would have exploded and all been killed. But he managed to get us over the surface of a semi-frozen lake and he did a belly landing, which actually, you know, would we would have been safe. But by the time the plane came to a stop, it was right at the edge of the ice, right next to open water and the, the weight of the plane quickly broke the ice, the plane nosedived and it sank into very deep water. So we had to very quickly get out while the plane was sinking. I managed to get out. I pulled the nurse out together. We were trying to pull the patient out. Then pilot got out the other side. The plane nosedived and was gone. Unfortunately, we were unable to get the patient out. Then all of a sudden I found myself in water, in a lake. It's sub-zero weather. It's in a blizzard. The closest shore was about 200 yards away and there was open water with a really strong current between me and the closest land. And I later found out that this place that we crashed is called Devil's Gap on Lake of the Woods by Kenora. And it's called Devil's Gap because of the strong current there it makes it very treacherous in winter and summer and the ice never freezes there in winter. I had to swim the Devil's Gap 
in order to get to the closest shore. And the voice in my head kept repeating, swim to shore, swim to shore. So, so finally I, I struggled and started swimming this long and seemingly impossible swim to shore. It was a long and very difficult swim. And I went under several times and my lungs were filled with lake water and I would kick and kick and kick with all my might struggling to get my face above water and then to gasp some more air into my lungs. Anyway, somewhere on the part way in swimming to shore is when my near death experience deepened. And what happened was all of a sudden I heard a roaring noise again, like a roaring rushing noise. And I felt my consciousness whoosh up out of my body. And I found myself 20 or 30 feet above my body looking down. Now, it was not that straightforward because my body was still alive. I was still swimming to shore. It was actually like my consciousness was two places at the same time. And how I compare this to uh, is like a split screen TV, where most of my consciousness was like the big image on the TV. Most of my consciousness was now 20 or 30 feet above my physical body, but like the little image, the little tiny image on the split screen TV, a little bit of my consciousness at the same time was in my body that was still desperately struggling to swim to shore without drowning. And then the main part of my consciousness went higher. And I went into this place that was filled with light. Now, those of you, you've probably all heard other NDE stories. So you've all heard about the realm of light. Um, I had not heard of it at that point in my life. But the thing for me was not so much that there was light in this realm. The most powerful thing that I experienced in the realm of light was the love. I felt profound, unconditional love. I felt like I was home, that this is where I belonged. For a moment, I saw like a face of light and then it sort of shifted into the periphery. The realm of light that as I experienced it, the closest thing that I've been able to find that, that resembles what it was like was when you're in an airplane and you're rising up through the clouds, just before you break through the clouds into the bright sunlight above, where it's all glistening and bright and sparkling and there's a diffuse white light around you, that's what the realm of light was like the, as I experienced it. And it was just filled with this incredible love. And I just knew things, not that a voice spoke or anybody told me, I just somehow knew things while I was in this realm of light, feeling this incredible love. I absolutely knew that what I was experiencing was the love of the higher power or what I had been taught to call God. And God, as I was experiencing it, was not anything like what I had been taught God was like. It was not an old man sitting on a throne, having a long beard, judging you. Have you been good? Have you been bad? That was not what I was experiencing at all. I was experiencing something completely different. I was experiencing the higher power as like a universal force that's like interpenetrating all of creation and that knows the past, present, future, that's infinitely intelligent, but is profoundly loving, that loves each and every one of us as a part of itself. And I also absolutely knew that what I think of as me would continue to live even if my body down below did not survive this accident. And so in a very detached manner, because I was feeling such joy, such bliss, I really didn't care whether my body below lived or died. And I somehow knew that the higher power knew what was gonna happen. And I was sort of watching it, sort of like when you watch a TV show that you're not really interested in and you just wanna see the ending to see how did the producers make the story end. So I was watching down below to see, oh, how did the higher power make the story end for this body down below? Cause I was fine. I was in the light, I was in the love, I was in the joy. 
Anyway, my physical body through a series of miracles or coincidences, however you want to look at it, was able to swim to shore. I put all the details in my books. I'm having to make the short stories a bit short today because of time and other things I want to talk about. So if you want to know all the details, you can read my books. They're in there. But um, I managed to make it to shore. The pilot managed to make it to shore. And we were freezing to death. We were profoundly hypothermic and near drowning. And what we had swum to was an island. And the only vehicle that could possibly get to us because of the open water next to the island would be a helicopter. You couldn't get there by skidoo. You couldn't get there by boat. Couldn't get there by car. And normally, there's no helicopter anywhere in the area. But by coincidence, if you believe it, there was a helicopter that was grounded because of the same storage storm just five miles from where we landed. Similarly, when we crashed, nobody be able to find us. It's in like a blizzard. And um, uh, we're in the middle of nowhere in northern Ontario. The pilot radioed out a Mayday message, but the only way anyone could have picked it up is if they were directly overhead. And it so happens, by coincidence, there was an airplane directly overhead, a, a commercial Air Canada jet picked up the message, radioed it down to the ground. Anyone in the vicinity, you know, there's a, a mayday from a plane in distress that's crashed uh, and they gave the approximate locations. Anyway, these two pilots who had just met each other when the helicopter was down, Bob Grant and Brian Clegg, climbed into the helicopter, not thinking about their own lives and set out searching to look for us. And they had difficulty finding us because they were looking for wreckage because everywhere else it was frozen and they were looking for wreckage on the tree in the trees or wreckage in the ice or a fire or something, but our plane had sunk. And then when they couldn't find us, they thought, hmm, could they possibly have gone right into the patch of open water? And they came back and eventually they, they pulled the nurse who was still in the water holding on to some frozen wood. They pulled her out and brought her to Kenora Hospital and they came back and they brought us, they half carried, half dragged me into the helicopter and then took us to Kenora Hospital, which was the local closest hospital. Now I remember floating from above and watching as my body was put on a, you know, they landed the helicopter in the hospital driveway and the emergency staff came running out with their gurneys and they put us on the gurneys and they wheeled us into the emergency department. I watched as a nurse tried to take my temperature with a standard thermometer and she was puzzled why she couldn't get a temperature reading and it was because I was hypothermic. I was colder than the bottom reading on her standard thermometer. And I could feel my consciousness drifting further and further away from my body and I knew I was dying but it didn't matter. I was in the love, I was in the, the joy, I was in the bliss. And then all of a sudden I heard a voice say, boy, could I use a hot bath? And I was surprised to see that those words came out of my mouth because I had not been thinking of saying those words, but they came out of my mouth. But you know, that's exactly what we needed. We needed to be reheated and we needed to reheat it quickly. And then the nurses looked at each other and says, Jay, maybe we should take them down to the hot whirlpool baths in the physiotherapy department and warm them up, which is what they did. They wheeled us there. They put my body in the hot whirlpool bath. And it was there when my body was reheated that I felt my consciousness re-enter my body. And what that felt like was whoosh, like they depict a genie being sucked into a bottle. It was like I was in this big expansive place above and then I was sucked down abruptly through the top of my head into the relatively small confines of my physical body. And I remember thinking, I'm back, I'm back, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live. Now this experience impacted me tremendously. This was at the end of my residency. It, 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 I was so filled with love afterwards. It was like I was love intoxicated. It was like I brought some of that love back with me. I remember I was off work for a month because I had so severe frostbite in my hands and I, you know, recovering from the lake water in my lungs. And good thing I had that time to integrate because I, I don't know what people would have thought. I was just bubbling with love. I would look out my window, I'd see the squirrels playing in the yard and I'd feel these waves of love for the squirrels or I'd see children 
riding their bicycles and I'd feel waves of love for the children riding their bicycles. I'd listen to music and all sorts of music would like I'd feel so inspired and moved to tears. I was just just oozing love. But it also did some very positive things psychologically for me with all of this love. I had been feuding with my father for many years. You know how young people get misunderstandings with their parents. Well, I had not been talking with my father for maybe two years. And my last words to him were, I think, quite rude. And um, so I called up my dad after this experience. And I said to my father, I said, dad, I love you. Let's be friends. And my father and I were able to reconcile, talk over our differences. Nothing had changed about my father. You know, those things that used to bother me and seem so important to me, they just didn't matter to me anymore. What mattered was the love that we shared. And my, I, I look at this as one of the greatest gifts that I got out of that near-death experience. This is the reconciliation of my relationship with my father. And we had seven wonderful years of a loving father-daughter relationship until my father ultimately died seven years later. And I'm profoundly grateful for that. So, you know, as a young medical doctor, I went and I talked with some of my medical friends, you know, once I was off my sick leave and I asked them, you know, gee, have you ever heard of anything like what I experienced in the plane crash? And all the doctors around me, they all knew that I was, you know, I had a very good reputation as a doctor and I was very mentally solid. Um, so they all came up with a hallucination theory, right? So one would say, oh, you were clearly hallucinating because of a low blood sugar. And I think, no, I don't think that's it. Someone else said, oh, I think you were hallucinating because of an electrolyte imbalance. And no, that's not it. So I, I really was not finding uh, any validation or explanation when I tried to speak to my medical colleagues. Then there was this person in Toronto who considered themselves an expert on near-death experiences. So I went and spoke to that person just in case maybe this was a near-death experience. And so that person said to me, well, did you see a tunnel with a white light at the end of it? And I went, mm, no. <laughs> they went, uh, were you clinically dead? And I said, um, no, don't think so. And then he said, clearly it was not a near-death experience. So this was in 1979. So I thought, okay, it's not a near-death experience. It's not a hallucination. What is it then? So I started searching just privately in my private life outside of my medical practice to try and figure out what on earth is this experience that happened to me? The closest thing I was able to find was a mystical experience. So for many years, I called my experience in the plane crash, the mystical experience that happened to me in the plane crash. But things got more complicated because about a month after I had what I now know was a near death experience, because as I'm gonna be telling you later, you don't need to be clinically dead and you don't always see a tunnel in a near death experience. The, the information I got was incorrect. So um, about a month after what I now know was a near death experience, I had a psychic awakening. I had my first clairvoyant experience. I was driving to visit a friend and I was stopped in an intersection with my car at a red light. And all of a sudden in my mind's eye, I got a really clear visual image of my friend's brain covered in pus. And so to me, as a medical doctor, it was really, really clear the symbology was for meningitis. And somehow I also knew that it was my friend's brain. And so when I arrived at my friend's house later, you know, I asked her sort of tentatively, how are you feeling? And sure enough, she had a headache and a fever. And later on that day, she was diagnosed with meningitis and fortunately given the appropriate treatments and she was fine afterwards. So I started having clairvoyant experiences and clairsentient experiences and mediumistic experiences and then later past life recall. So here am I as a young doctor, I'd had a Kundalini awakening, then I'd had what I thought was a mystical experience or maybe a near death experience. And then I had psychic awake, a psychic awakening and having various types of psychic experiences. So I started researching 
the whole spectrum of what I now call spiritually transformative experiences because they were happening to me. But I was doing this in the closet. So I was, tra I was on faculty at the University of Toronto and I had my traditional medical career and did all sorts of wonderful things and got promoted and all that. But in my private life, I was a spiritual seeker and a mystic and really embracing my spiritual practice and reading from all different faiths in the mystical traditions, reading what doctors have written about all these experiences. And so, but people heard about me and slowly more and more people started coming to see me in my office in Toronto as patients and telling me stories about their own experiences. So over these years, like people heard somehow via the grapevine that there was this doctor who would not automatically label you as crazy because she's had her own experiences. So I heard horror stories from people about how people had been mislabeled and pathologized and told they were crazy and sent to psychiatry or put in the psychiatric hospital or given electroshock treatment and their families telling them they're crazy or hallucinating because they've had a mystical experience or a near-death experience or a psychic awakening. And I knew these people were not crazy because I was experiencing this myself. And then everything changed in 1990, just because of time, I won't have time to explain the experience, but I had a very strong mystical experience in 1990 that I call my calling mystical experience. And when I had this experience, I knew that it was time to come out of the closet, that I had to come out of the closet and start publicly advocating for experiencers that I had to say that, yes, I have had a near-death experience in 1990. I also met Kenneth Ring, one of the co-founders of IANS. And with my knees knocking, I, you know, I was much younger than him. I went up to him and I said, I think the researchers are wrong. I think you can have a near-death experience when you're facing death. I don't think you have to be clinically dead. And then uh, he just laughed and he said to me, yes, Yvonne, I've come to the same conclusion and so have other researchers. You don't have to be clinically dead to have a near-death experience. You can be facing death and yours absolutely was. So with that behind me, with the, that, that one of the foremost researchers in NDEs, um, Kenneth ring had confirmed what I had decided that it was a near-death experience, then uh, I felt strong enough to go public and start talking about my experience, not to try and be a grandiose or anything, but just to advocate for people so that the medical profession would stop doing harm labeling experiencers as crazy, that the public would stop doing harm, labeling experiencers as crazy, and that churches would stop doing harm by labeling experiencers as this is work of the devil, which was also happening. So in the 90s, I opened the Spiritual Emergence Research and Referral Clinic, and I got involved with the Kundalini Research Network. I became the Canadian Coordinator for the Spiritual Emergence Network. So my practice then, you know, the two parts of my life came together. And um, I met Daniel Brinkley and Betty Eady when they were in Toronto that, you know, they were the two biggest NDE experiencers. This is right when it was coming out in the public in the early 1990s. And so in Canada, I was the big NDE experiencer in Canada. So I was was asked on the same stage with them and I was on television shows and radio shows and asked to speak to doctors, asked to speak to the public, speaking at conferences all over. And right, I started writing books about STEs. I coined the phrase spiritually transformative experiences in 1994. I thought I'd be doing that till I was 90. But guess what? God had other plans for me because um, I'm just going to skip now to my most neat recent near-death experience in 2003. In 2003, I had a serious slip and fall accident at Niagara Falls. And I wanna tell you before I had the slip and fall accident, I had been meditating at the foot of the falls. I love meditating there because the roar of the ocean at, Ni at the falls at Niagara Falls reminds me of the ohm vibration. And I go very deep, very quickly in my meditation. So I was meditating there and what happened was I slipped into a state of communion in my meditation. 
And I suddenly could see the other side with my eyes wide open. I could see the white light realm. And I could see a being of light there on the other side. It was Mahavatar Babaji and his white light body. And he telepathically communicated to me, welcome home. And I did not know that I was about to die two hours later, which I did in my accident. I now wonder if that two hours of communion that I had before I had my accident and died was actually my deathbed vision, my end of life experience, you know, where people have the veils thin and they're communicating with the other side. Because that's exactly what I experienced for two hours before my accident. And then I slipped on black ice, fell back, hit my head on rock pavement, had a serious traumatic brain injury with a hemorrhage and I died. Suddenly I felt myself whisked out of my body by a force greater than myself. And in like twinkling of an eye, I went through a dark expanse of space, which some people might call a tunnel, but to me it felt like a dark expanse of space. And then I found myself in the white light realm again. And I was being welcomed into the white light realm by two beings of light that I instantly recognized. They were two saints from my own spiritual tradition, Paramahansa Yogananda and Mahavatar Babaji. And they telepathically communicated to me that I had died, that my work in the incarnation as Dr. Yvonne Kaysan was finished. And the feeling there was of incredible joy, incredible celebration, incredible love. It was almost like a graduation party was being held in my honor, you know, that I graduated and I made it, you know, past the graduation ceremony. And uh, I just felt, I remember I got a little worried because by this time in my life, I'd learned a lot about near-death experiences. And I thought, uh-oh, here comes the life review. <laughs> And then they just sort of looked at me because, you know, nobody's been perfect. Everyone's made mistakes in their life, me included. But they just sort of looked at me and with the thought is me like how this thought was conveyed so instantly was it just it doesn't matter. And I just understood that just like a parent understands that when a child is learning to walk, it's going to stumble, it's going to skin its knees, it's going to fall and bump its head. It's just all part of the learning process and it was understood with such complete love that I just didn't have to worry about any goofs that I'd done along the way. And then I entered into what, what I describe as a realm of pure thought, like I was no longer seeing visual images or the realm of light or the beings of light, but it just, it's like my consciousness opened in a realm of pure thought and I was able to absorb vast amounts of information all at once, not in a linear fashion, the way that, that we um, <laughs> pick up information, but all at once I knew a lot. And suddenly I re-remembered all of my past lives. And it was like an aha moment because it's like before I'd known several of my past lives, it was like having pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but now all the pieces were put together into a coherent picture. I could see how it all fit together. It all made sense. Suddenly what I considered my rather unusual life as Dr. Yvonne Kaysan having all of these NDEs and STEs all the time, it made complete sense because this was not my first incarnation having near-death experiences. And this was not my first incarnation having spiritually transformative experiences. So it seemed like I was just picking up from what I'd been in the past. Anyway, time seemed to pass very differently up, up on the other side. It was like past, present and future all seemed to coexist and almost as if they were occurring at the same time. And so I was there for what I call timeless time. And then suddenly the beings of light appeared to me again and they telepathically communicated to me, you may now choose whether to incarnate into the body of a babe to further serve the divine and or to return to the injured body, actually they use the word maimed body, which I had to look up in the dictionary after I got back because that's not my vocabulary. Maimed means with a disability or a handicap, but I got what it sort of what it meant or to return into the main body. So I was given the choice 
And I remember when I was given that choice, it literally felt like the response from came out of my heart, that it didn't come out of my head. It was like my intellect was taking a holiday or something. And my heart was just wide open and feeling love and ecstasy and joy. And it literally felt like the words came out of my heart. And what came out as a thought out of my heart was, oh, masters, please guide me. I want to do God's will. What is the higher choice? And they so lovingly, like how a thought can be so exquisitely loving, but it was, it was exquisitely loving. They communicated to me telepathically. It will be more difficult, but to return to the injured body. And again, my intellect did not pipe in and go like, what do you mean by more difficult? Like, what exactly do you mean? No, it's like my intellect was on holiday. My heart was just wide open. I was so absolutely trusting in the divine plan. My heart just instantly responded, I accept. And faster than the speed of thought, it was between the thought I and the thought accept is when I woke up in my previously dead body with <gasps> this gasp of air. And I found myself lying on the ground there. It was at Niagara Falls. I don't know if I told you where that's where it was by the falls. I was lying on the ground. And for the first few moments, as I was breathing life back into my body, I could see both realms perfectly clearly. I could see the white light realm and the two saints in their white light bodies. It's like they had ushered me back into my body. They were right there, right in front of me. I could see them. I could see the white light realm clear as could be with my eyes open and the physical world. It was like they were both superimposed on each other. And then what happened was that the white light realm started fading from view, that split screen TV again, until finally, 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 it just became like a dot in the distance. And then I was back. But I was back in a seriously injured body with a traumatic brain injury. This traumatic brain injury disabled me. I went to neuro rehab for seven years, trying to get back to the work that I love, trying to get back to writing, public speaking, counseling experiencers. But I just had to accept that it appeared to be the divine plan that I was going to be disabled and that how I would serve now was through my prayers and meditations. And so I embraced that. I embraced it very intensely. I had lost the ability to meditate with my head injury. I had to work very, very hard to get my ability to meditate back. It took years. And I thought that this was what the rest of my life was going to be, that I was going to be quietly like a little hermit meditating and praying for people, but not out in public anymore. And so you might wonder, hey, what are you doing here speaking and president of Spiritual Awakenings International, past president of IANS? Well, guess what? God had other plans. A miracle happened. On February 24th, 2016, more than 12 years after I was disabled by my traumatic brain injury, while deep in meditation in the SRF meditation retreat in Encinitas, California, I had a miracle. While I was meditating inwardly, I experienced like an eruption of light in the center of my head, like a, a liquid light volcano erupted in the center of my head. And this experience felt like I woke up after being asleep for 12 years and my brain was healed. And after that healing experience, I wrote two new books in my first year after the healing. And um, the first book is Touched by the Light has been published. The second one, I'm waiting to publish it still. And then after that, my book was written, I got the prod to start public speaking. The first place I got the invitation to speak to was IANS. So then I went and spoke at IANS down in Denver. I, call, I think it was 2017, was it? Uh, and then uh, 2018, IANS invites me to be on the board of directors. And 2019, I get nominated as president. And 2020, guess what, is when Robert and I founded Spiritual Awakenings International, the spirit has called us to, all because of that miracle. So I'm now going to screen share. Those are the stories I wanted to share with you today. 
So let me see if I can screen share with you. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about everything you need to know about near-death experiences. So let me see if I can get this to go correctly. OK, so everything I'm talking about today, I'm sorry I'm unable to get the slide thing off the left. I usually can do it. Maybe I can. Um, but is in my book, Touched by the Light, Exploring Spiritually Transformative Experiences. If you want to read more about my experiences and all about spiritually transformative experiences, you can uh, get my book. So I coined this term, spiritually transformative experiences, as I told you back in 1994. And near-death experiences are one type of spiritually transformative experience. And what I noticed was that... Um, all these types of experiences that are under the umbrella of spiritually transformative experiences can all cause a spiritual awakening in the person having them. And they all have very similar after effects, physically, psychologically, spiritually, and psychically, which is why I felt they needed to be looked at together and not just individually. Now, how I classify the STE types is uh, very much based in yoga. I found yoga gave me the best model for understanding spiritually transformative experiences. So first is mystical experiences, which in yoga are called samadhis. And there are many types of mystical experiences, but that's not the focus of today's talk. Then psychic or intuitive experiences, which in yoga are called cities. Again, many, many types of these, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, past life recall, uh, mediumship, channeling, all of these uh, transdimensional experiences are various types of cities or psychic intuitive experiences. Then there are the spiritual energy or kundalini awakenings. Then of course, our near death experiences, which is gonna be the focus I'm gonna be talking about today. Then we have other death related STEs, which I'll talk about briefly, and inspired creativity and genius are the main categories. So let's the near death experience. What is a near death experience? What have we learned in 40 years of research? Well, a near death experience is an out of body and or white light mystical experience. And it happens when a person is close to death, clinically dead, or facing imminent death or severe trauma. So you do not have to be dead. You can be facing death, close to death, facing trauma. But you need to have both. You need to have an out of body and or mystical experience. And it has to happen when you're close to death, facing death, etc. So if you're just meditating in your living room and you see a tunnel and go to the light and blah, 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 that sounds like a near death experience. It's not because you're just sitting in your living room meditating. It is a mystical experience that resembles a near death experience. Similarly, if you have an out of body experience when you're you know, watching the sunset or meditating, that is an out of body experience. It's only called a near death experience when it happens when you're close to death, clinically dead or facing imminent death or trauma. Now, some people are making another mistake with definitions, <laughs> which is this, every brush with death is not a near death experience. So some people are making the mistake of thinking every time they were close to death or uh, every time that they had a brush with death or even if they were clinically dead for a while and resuscitated, that it's called a near-death experience. No, it is not. It is only called a near-death experience if while you're having your brush with death, not with a toothbrush, that you, <laughs> that you have the out-of-body experience and or white light mystical experience. So what are the features of a near-death experience? I'm going to go through these quite quickly because I think most of you are quite familiar with them. But I just want to point out that our wonderful Dr. Raymond Moody back in 1975, he defined the features of near-death experiences in his groundbreaking book, and they are still true to this day. We understand them a little more. We know how frequently they happen now, but uh, they're still the same features as it was right from the beginning. And the average near-death experience 
experience has six or seven of the features out of the, the 15 that I'm going to read to you. Um, and a deeper experience sometimes I have as many as 12 or 14. So you select from these in terms of a near death experience. First off, they're an experience that is a lived experience. It's ineffable. That means it's beyond words. The only way to really understand what it is is to have the experience yourself. Auditory awareness is the second feature that often comes that people hear what is being said around their dead or unconscious body. The next feature frequently is the strong feeling of peace, you know, that they lose their fear of death. Uh, they no longer feel afraid. They no longer feel pain. They may hear an unusual inner sounds and they can be all sorts of different inner sounds. Some people hear a, a rushing or a roaring sound. Other people hear more like a tinkling of bell sounds or celestial music or celestial chimes, various unusual sign, sounds. Then going out of body, I think everyone's heard about the out of body experience where it seems your point of perception. Usually it's above your body. Sometimes it can be beside your body. Other times it can be uh, another room in the same building or traveling to uh, visit uh, and see what loved ones are doing at a different location. Some people go through a dark space or tunnel, uh, and, but not a large proportion. Um, some people will go on to meet spirits, beings of light, and these are usually people that they know, although sometimes it is not, and sometimes it can be people from uh, religious traditions or like the saints that I saw. And then there's the white light realm, which is universally described as a love, uh, a realm filled with love and the presence of the higher power. Some people will get a life review, although not everyone. I had a life review in a brief life review in my fourth near death experience that I didn't describe today, but in my other ones I did not. By the way, all five of my near death experiences were different, which is also what happens with multiple NDE experiencers that they're not the same even within the same experiencer. Many people get a life barrier or a choice. In my uh, 2003 one, I was given the choice. In my 1979 one and all my other ones, I was not given a choice. I was just sent back. The return to the body is tends to be very abrupt, very sudden. People suddenly wake. It's not like this leisurely coming down the tunnel like it was going out, but abruptly you're back in the body. Afterwards, people are convinced of the reality of the experience and the memory of the experience seems to be etched in their memory for some reason. Like you forget what you ate for breakfast yesterday, but people can remember their near-death experiences that happened 40, 50 years ago. And there's a transformational impact physically, psychologically, spiritually. People emerge with new views on death. They lose their fear of death. And there's independent corroboration of things that were observed while out of body. And this is called veridical perception. So these are the features. Now, near-death experiences, although Raymond Moody coined the phrase in 1976, it has been uh, described for centuries. And this is a painting from the 1500s by Hieronymus Bosch, showing people going down a tunnel towards the light, seemingly accompanied by angels. Now, who would be able to draw such a painting unless they'd had such an experience or somebody had described to them such an experience. And then other books like the Tibetan Book of the Dead and in the yogic scriptures, they also describe near-death experiences. So it's been known for millennia. Now, what is the frequency of near-death experiences? Dr. Pinbaum Lummel has done a really phenomenal research project with cardiac arrest patients. And he discovered that it was 12% of cardiac arrest patients. So these were patients that were observed and monitored, confirmed that they were clinically dead for periods of time, that only one in eight, when asked afterwards, reported having a near-death experience when they were clinically dead for that period of time, which meant seven out of eight did not. And who can have near-death experiences? Now we know anybody, the old, the young, neonates, men, women, all cultures, all races, all religions, no religions, anyone can have a near-death experience. 
circumstances, you name it, in the womb, difficult childbirths and in the incubators, cardiac arrests at all ages, surgeries that go bad, near drowning and drowning accidents, severe illnesses, convulsions, accidents of all kinds, car accidents, plane accidents, train accidents, slip and fall accidents, near miss accidents when you think you're going to be in a crash but then in the in the end you're not electrocutions being hit by lightning allergic reactions facing death combat severe trauma and abuse now what about the nde types there are three main nde types and i write about this in more description in my book one is the out of body type of near death experience. And in this experience, this type of NDE, people experience themselves being out of body. And that is, they feel the peace, they feel the calm, they observe things that are happening around their bodies. Maybe they observe things happening with their loved ones or elsewhere around their, where their body is. But that is their entire near death experience. So this would be the out of body type of near death experience. Then there are other people who go on to what we call the deeper near-death experience. It might start with an out-of-body experience, and they go into the mystical or white light experience. And it's those people who have the mystical or white light near-death experience, that type, who tend to be the most transformed. Their lives completely change sometimes by a white light mystical type of near-death experience. The third type that we must not forget is a distressing near-death experience. And I have found in my clinical experience about three distinct types of distressing near-death experiences. And the first type is people who were fighting the pull to the light. So people who went out of body, they knew intuitively that this meant that they were dying or close to death. They didn't want to die. They felt themselves being pulled towards the light. And so they're fighting against it. And people have described this to me like trying to swim against an undertow in the ocean. It's an incredible struggle. It's horrible. It's distressing trying to get back into your body when you're being pulled so strongly out of your body. So this is the one type of distressing NDE that has been described to me. The second type of distressing NDE that I've heard from people is what I call the low astral NDE. And this is, you know, according to yoga, there are many astral planes and there are levels in the astral planes from the darker ones to the lighter ones. And that when we leave, we go to an astral plane and we hope to go up to the lighter ones, the astral heavens, but that sometimes people go to the lower astral planes where they might experience dark or tormenting entities. Good news is people like Pastor Howard Storm, who started off with a low astral NDE, uh, NDE with tormenting entities when he started to pray or sing, I believe he was starting to sing Jesus Loves Me, that it converted into a white light type of NDE when a beam of light came and raised him up. So if you get into one of these low astral ones, the, 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 the tip is start praying, start singing to God, however you relate to the higher power and it can be converted into a white light one. Then I've heard a third type of distressing NDE. And these are the ones that I call um, nightmare-like distortions. And I don't even know if these are really NDEs, like they sound like, you know, um, hallucinations on LSD or something where faces are all distorted and colors and, you know, and I wonder if this might be due to toxins in the brain causing something to look very distorted. And then there's one other thing I want to mention. Some people who've had NDEs are very angry or distressed, not because there was anything distressing about their NDE per se, but because they're mad, they were sent back to their bodies. It was so much nicer on the other side. They're distressed that they were sent back. So I wanna talk a little bit about the yogic model to understand a near-death experience. So according to yoga, we are all spiritual beings. We are all souls. We are all immortal souls. And our soul is encased in three successively denser bodies. So the first body is called your causal body, which is made up of consciousness or intelligence. Your next denser body is called your astral body, which is made up of prana or life energy and light, or some call it chi. 
So that's your astral body, your energy body. And then your most dense body that you're encased in is your physical body. And according to yoga, their understanding of a near-death experience is that at conception, so when we are conceived, the soul, which is encased in its astral and causal body, links with the physical body. And it actually descends into the body through the developing uh, brain and spinal cord. At death or at near death, what happens is the reverse. The soul encased in the astral and causal body withdraws. It starts going up the spine in order to leave the body through the head. And something called the Kundalini might awaken and the soul exits with the astral and causal body. It leaves the physical body like stepping out of a pair of clothes, old pair of clothes, and will go to some astral plane. We'll either go to astral heavens or to us other astral planes. Now, the interesting thing in yoga is that there's also an understanding that some people only go for a short time to astral heaven, and then they enter what they call the great sleep between incarnations. And it also makes me think that those people who don't experience a near-death experience when they were uh, dead for a period of time, maybe they went directly into this great sleep between incarnations. I just wanted to share that tidbit with you. The thing about Kundalini, Kenneth Ring, Bruce Grayson, myself, Gopi Krishna had all written about the possible Kundalini awakening happening during, during near death experiences. Many NDEers afterwards realized they are having symptoms of Kundalini activation. And Bruce Grayson has done research showing that NDEers have higher scores on his Kundalini rating scales. So, and when the Kundalini awakens and the soul goes up the spine, there are these energy centers called the chakras that supposedly the soul would go up, rising to the top up these chakras. Now, each of these chakras has particular symptoms. Interestingly enough, the progression of symptoms that people have in a near-death experience, we can correlate them to the progression of going up the chakras. So the first sensation of this feeling of peace, no fear, that is the sensation when we move into the second chakra. Also in the second chakra is where you have clear audience hearing what is being said around your dead or unconscious body. Going out of body can happen at the third, fifth or sixth chakra according to uh, yogic tradition. The roaring sound that some people hear or the om some people call it is the sign of the kundalini rushing up the astral sign, the spine. Other people hear ringing, tinkling sounds. Those ringing, tinkling sounds are the inner astral sounds of the chakras. And the dark space and tunnel in yoga, it is believed when people see that, that is actually what you perceive when you're moving through the third eye or the sixth chakra. And that if you enter the white light mystical experience, that happens at the sixth or the seventh chakra. So. I'm just sharing with you an interesting understanding, a yogic understanding of the near-death experience. Now, near-death experiences have definite physical, psych psychological, spiritual after effects. Because of time, I'm going to run through this very quickly. But physical after effects that are common, less tolerance to chemicals and med medications, more sensitive to bright light and loud noises, increased food allergies, new food sensitivities, lower blood pressure, synesthesia, which is the blending of um, blending senses. They may have migratory body pains, particularly at chakra points. Um, there may be swings in energy level, changes in sleep pattern. The most pronounced thing that many NDEers and STEers experience is middle of the night wakening, where they wake up in the middle of the night around three o'clock in the morning. Um, somebody's unmuted and making a little bit of noise. If you could mute yourself, it would be deeply appreciated. Another common physical after effect that I want to talk about is electromagnetic sensitivity. Now, electromagnetic sensitivity 
has two components. One is that NDE and STE experiencers, it's like their energy field seems to affect electronic equipment. So you can short out light bulbs, you can short out microphones, you can make computers not work. Um, you can make the, the dinger security screener go off at the airport. All these sorts of things are one form of the electromagnetic sensitivity. The other form is that people notice that they themselves are sensitive to external electromagnetic fields. So they might feel themselves very disturbed uh, and when they're close to high power lines or places that are emitting strong electromagnetic uh, vibrations. People will often have sensations of energy movements in their body, like up the spine, up the bodies, vibrating with energy. And some people have rapid healing after an NDE. Psychological after effects, you should probably all know these new interests, they become more creative, often happier. There may be a maturation of personality, the person finally grows up. They set healthier boundaries in relationships, they may abandon some of their self-destructive habits like finally quit smoking, finally get into recovery for, for, for getting rid of their addictions. Um, they may reevaluate jobs and relationships to see if you know this really suits them. They may have a stronger sense of life purpose. And also repressed memories may spontaneously surface for healing. This is a normal after effect. Psychic NDE after effects become more intuitive, more psychic. They may be clairsentient where they can pick up and feel other people's uh, pain, emotional pain, physical pain, illnesses by feeling it in your own body. Clairvoyant where you're visually seeing things beyond the range of thought. Clairaudient where you're hearing things beyond the range of thought. Premonitions, precognition, past life recall. Many people develop healing abilities higher guidance, being able to receive guidance from your spirit guides, downloads of information that are guiding you, medium sip channeling, all common psychic NDE after effects. And then of course, there are powerful spiritual NDE after effects. People lose their fear of death, particularly those who've had the white light NDE. They're convinced of the reality of an afterlife and many become convinced of the reality of reincarnation expansive concepts about love. They're more into brotherly love, loving everyone, rather than just selfishly loving one person only. They become convinced of the reality of a higher power. Uh, they may become much more generous, less materialistic, want to do a lot of volunteer work, um, less interested in becoming wealthy and more interested in becoming of service and may become much more spiritual, but maybe less religious, commonly much less dogmatic in their religious views. But there can also be challenging NDE after effects. And people sometimes feel like they're exploding afterwards, that they have difficulties with relationships because really they're not the same person that they were before. Their perspectives have changed on a number of fundamental issues. So this can lead to difficulties in relationships, whether that be family relationships, marital relationships, work relationships. People can be confused or anxious, particularly if they don't have anybody around them to validate what's happened to them, if they don't even have a name to call their experience. They are afraid of being labeled as crazy. And a lot of times people actually think they are going crazy because they've not found a non-pathological way of understanding their experience. Some people get very fixated with the experience and they just are thinking about it all the time. They want to draw about it. They want to journal about it. They want to talk about it, which can be a difficult on relationships and, and in life in general. The, the surfacing of unresolved issues, I call that, you know, the inner light shone on the inner house and what needed to be healed came out. And so if some of the unresolved issues that are surfacing are highly traumatic, like say childhood sexual abuse, this can be very, very challenging. And many people also will be challenged by they feel sadness, despair, that the NDE bliss and joy has ended and they're coming back to a much more difficult place down here. They wish they were on the other side. Now, I want to point out that after the initial awakening near-death experience or other STE, that's the first awakening experience, 
many, many people become multiple experiencers. They may become multiple STE experiencers. They started with an NDE, but now they're having psychic experiences. Now they're having mystical experiences, or they might start having multiple NDEs over the course of their lifetime, like me, where I've now realized I've had five NDEs over the course of my life. I want to say a couple of things about children's near-death experiences. I had two near-death experiences as a child. That's a little picture of me when I was little. And children's near-death experiences typically have less features than adult near-death experiences. And they may not be interpreted by the child as paranormal. I mean, I certainly never thought these were near-death experiences. I didn't realize till about three years ago that I had two near-death experiences as a child because I just thought it was normal. I mean, when I was almost hit as a train when I was five years old and I went out of body, I thought I was flying. That's how I understood it as a five-year-old. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't fly after that. I kept on, you know, I'd climb up on my fence, jump off. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't fly because I could so clearly remember flying, but that's how I understood my out-of-body near-death experience when I was a five-year-old. And similarly, as an 11-year-old, I was unconscious for three days in a serious car accident. I remember floating above the accident. I remember floating above the emergency room, watching the doctors try to resuscitate me. I had no clue this was paranormal. I thought that's what happened to everybody when they were in a coma. And so children's NDEs are often accompanied by beings of light animals, or they may have animal encounters. And some children's NDE after effects, TMH Atwater has written about this extensively. I'm just going to go very quickly because of time. They may be have an intense curiosity about God, become gifted in math, science, music, become highly creative. They may shift towards being a fast talker and thinker. They may be distressed by violence, the violence in news reports, just like rough games. Uh, they may have light and sound sensitivity. Children often become psychically open, intuitive, have premonitions, and they may see spirits and communicate with them. Veterans and military often also have special issues related to near-death experiences and STEs. They have concerns about the NDE or other ST getting on the official record because they worry it might impact their career. It might affect their security clearances. It might affect their benefits. They also, if they have the white light type of near-death experience, may be concerned that they're not going to be able to deal with the violence in combat now that they've had the near-death experience. And military healthcare providers may incorrectly lump the near-death experience or STE as part of post-traumatic stress. But it is not, I'm not going to go through the side, but the features of post-traumatic stress are not the same as a near-death experience. I want to wrap up now and talk very briefly about other death related STEs. And there are three that I want to mention. And that is the first is deathbed visions or end of life experiences. So this is an STE. It can sometimes be NDE like or not, but it happens to people days, weeks, or months before they die. The second category is the death watch experience or the shared death experience. And this is a STE that happens right at the time that somebody else dies. And it's more likely to happen if you're right at the bedside when somebody dies, like you might see a white orb leave their body or they might you have, and have a vision of them going into the light or you might feel a force field of love come over you or it could happen remotely. Um, you know, one person told me he was going to visit his mom in the hospital and all of a sudden he saw his mom's face as a reflection in the mirror, the rear view mirror of his car. And that happened right exactly at the moment that his mom died. Uh, another person told me that uh, she was washing the dishes and suddenly she started doubling over with chest pain. She picked up the physical symptoms of her father who was dying in Europe of a heart attack and then suddenly his face popped in her mind and then she got the phone call. Yes, he had died of a massive heart attack. So death watch or shared death experiences, they happen right at the time that somebody else died. And then the first death, uh, the last death related STE is the after death communication, which happens days, weeks or months after person dies. So how can we support NDE and STE experiencers? What have we learned in 40 years? The most important thing is to listen, listen, listen. 
in a supportive manner. People need to be able to talk about it. People are looking for a safe harbor where they're going to be validated. If you can educate them, give them a name for their experience and refer them for support, suggest some NDE books, some support groups like Seattle IANS or Spiritual Awakenings International where they can get some support around their experience. So my final words, what have I learned in 40 years of researching and experiencing NDEs and SDEs? One, that they are absolutely real. They are not hallucinations. They are not a sign of mental illness. Secondly, after your awakening SDE, whether it's an NDE or other type of SDE, multiple SDEs start happening. And what used to become be called paranormal then becomes the new normal. <laughs> so anyway, because of time, I've gone over time. I'm going to skip a couple of slides. I'm going to end with that. Meditate. This is my book, Touched by the Light. Uh, if you want to know more about my experiences or what I said today. And please do feel free to check out our Spiritual Awakenings International site if you'd like to uh, learn more about STEs. So with that, I would be happy to uh, answer your questions. You're muted, Linda. Okay. There you are now. We can All right. Hear you. So I, we do have a couple of questions that have come up. Let me just bear with me. So this is from Den Denny. Yvonne says, it all made sense. For those who have not had such experiences, why is it so hard to figure out or make sense of our lives? Well, I would call that the great divine mystery <laughs> is that, um, you know, that, that how I understand it is this, is that it's like going to school. All our incarnations are like going to school and we have different lessons to learn depending on which grade or what class we're in at school. And um, I, Paramahansa Yogananda said, the reason we don't know all of our past lives is that it would be just so overwhelming and people tend to remember the bad things and feel bad about the bad things that we've done in past lives. So he considered it a great blessing that we do not remember our past lives. So I, I, I think that's probably true. For me, um, being able to see my past lives, it was a confirmation uh, because I'd seen many of my past lives before. It's helped me feel um, more whole. And I think that uh, my understanding is uh, from, because I'm a student of yoga and have been for 40 years, that when people really embrace their spiritual path and start meditating regularly and um, working on their inner issues, doing their inner house cleaning, trying to lead a moral life, that they will spontaneously start remembering past lives when it's important for them to understand what their soul lesson or growing is in this particular life. And in the meanwhile, we just have to do the best to learn our lessons and to serve in this world with, with what we know. True. Uh, and Denny also has read the autobiography of a yogi and she endorsed the book also um because he does talk about several of the aspects that you talked about then we have Ali and Ali is commenting uh, perhaps most of us do not fear death but more so we fear leaving our loved ones how do we reconcile this part of our life experience mm. that's a beautiful question Ali thank you you know of course, we are very attached to those that we love. And that is, that is natural, that is normal, that is healthy. But I think what I would say from my own experience of having been on the other side five times is that our loved ones will also live on. And that I believe that the bond of love draws people together again, incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. And I also believe, and it has been my experience, that we meet our loved ones on the other side. And many NDEers have attested to that, that they have met their loved ones. Some have even met their loved pets on the other side. So I think it comes down to 
trusting, you know, until we meet again, you know, that, that it's not a forever goodbye when we, when we're crossing to the other side, it's until we meet again. And I, and I'm hoping that might be helpful to help you let go of your loved ones when the time comes. Thank you. All right, now I've got Kimberly and she would like to share two things about electrical interference. So um, I'm gonna give Kim the spotlight for a moment. She just unmuted herself, add spotlight. There we go. Just Thank in. you. Thank you. I, I love me a good validation. And there are so many things that happen within the near-death experience or mystical experiences that are subjective or um, just back to the ineffable. One of the measurable aspects for some people who have had a near-death experience is the effect on electricity or electromagnetic stuff. Again, so rare to have these events witnessed, but I would like to share two times recently where that has been witnessed. One is with PMH. Are you still on, my darling? I believe she is. Okay. Uh, a year and a half ago, um, at the last IONS conference on the ground in Philadelphia, it was um, my pleasure, as always, to introduce PMH to a packed uh, auditorium situation, really standing room only. Now, PMH and I have known each other for almost 40 years, and we're both, don't get us in the same round, we're both like just, <laughs> and um, we love each other's energy very much. So I was introducing her, she came up to take the handheld microphone from me. We have three photos of this just as it was about to happen, but the uh, amplification system blew out the uh, audio system blew out. The room lights were already dim. They stayed on, but it was, again, it just was, Irk, ain't gonna happen with the two of us in close proximity. And the photos are, are, we were also laughing our socks off. And I had just talked about in my introduction of PMH, how she was such an electrical storm, lightning in a bottle when she was born. And then kaboom, the system blew in front of all of those attendees. So it was like, phew, we got, we got, can I get a witness? I mean, we got the witnesses. The other thing I wanted to share is very recently in my own life, I, um, this is the first time I've had makeup on and been out of my jammies in a while because I had um, three hour surgery with innovation as it turns out, but that's not my point right now. But uh, I was in that arena of post-surgical pain while in the hospital and uh, lots of physical trauma happened. By the way, I'm pulling out of it, just I need, you know, just need some more time. But at 5.20 in the morning, when it was dark in Seattle uh, on October 21st, again, still in a Seattle area inpatient setting, everything in my hospital room blew electrically. The, I was on an alarm bed that went out. The call button for the nurse went out. The pump on my IV went out. The lights in the room went out. The emergency backup generator lights in the room went, went out. Absolute pitch dark. So um, a, an engineer was called. I was a nurse's uproar. Yeah, what the heck is going on? So the engineer comes in finally, called from bed or someplace. And as he was entering the room, looking around, he goes, you know, this isn't a space capsule. All the wires on the floor are interconnected. And I just thought, he, 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 that's in my chart. And so that never happens when something's actually charted. So I'm going to pull my medical records and go, See, people, it can happen. So I just wanted to share, since they're both so recent. And, um, and hi, PMA. Thank you for listening. You can unmute me again. Thank you. 
Thank that you was for a great sharing that. Validation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to share too that I have one that was witnessed as well. That when I was on the Dr. Oz show and they were filming me, um, I blew the microphone that was taped to my body, and then they were scolding the uh, the the tech people. Why did they give me a dead bike microphone? Of course, they didn't give me a dead microphone. I, I had blown it with my body energy. So, anyway, so yes, these things really do happen. Okay, we have just a couple more comments. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but I'm going to say it's Vitana. She just makes a comment that I'm so happy when professionals had this and understand it. I do not have people around me to talk about it. So that is a reason we like to share through these presentations. Um, Angela has a comment. Who would you refer someone to who is having continual disturbances from what she calls the astral plane, our spirits, some very angry and others good, everything. The person is in their early 20s and I need to find some more information, but the person is very sensitive and I, I don't think they have had an NDE. Um, they seem to be, I don't think they had an NDE, but seems to be ungrounded and says they she has no control over the entities or spirits that come to her, sometimes in big groups. And she says she doesn't know what they want. That's a good example. I'm not sure if you can give us some insight to how you would address and that. Th thank you for that question. That actually brings up um, an issue that I did not discuss in um, today's presentation, which is uh, differentiating um, just a, a, a spiritual awakening from a spiritual emergency and differentiating a spiritual emergency from mental illness, from a psychiatric episode. And, um, and that really takes a professional to be able to make that sort of a um, distinction. And uh, some people, so I'm just going to talk about it very, very briefly, is that um, it's some people when after they've had their uh, awakening experience, whether it was a near death experience or a mystical experience or a psychic opening, whatever was their awakening experience, let's say it's a near death experience, that um, they'll, they'll start having lots of psychic phenomenon, lots of psychic phenomenon. And uh, sometimes they will think they're going crazy, so they don't tell anybody. That actually happens a lot. Um, it, but usually uh, it's not too distressing um, type of psychic phenomenon, meaning they're not having like tormenting voices or tormenting entities. When you start getting into what you're describing, where you're having tormenting voices or tormenting entities, that's causing a lot of distress in the person, then that starts shifting into what we call spiritual emergency. That, you know, that they're starting to have difficulties functioning. Uh, they're experiencing significant distress because of some of these, um, what we're presuming are psych psychic phenomenon that they are experiencing. Now, um, there also are mental illnesses like schizophrenia, for example, where people will have what's called auditory hallucinations. And that sometimes these auditory hallucinations, they might be described in a way that's very similar to what was described here. They might experience that there are, you know, these tormenting entities that are telling them to do bad things or telling them to hurt themselves or telling them to hurt others. And, um, I think this is not a, dis, uh, a distinction that an ordinary lay person can do. That it really, that somebody who's having this type of a situation where you're wondering, are they in spiritual emergency and they just need some help learning how to shield themselves from negative energies, how to ground themselves a little bit better, um, you know, and need a supportive ear to listen to, or is this now veering on the side of mental illness? Um, I, would I would refer such a person to um, assist. 
ASSIST has an, a referral network, the American Center for the uh, Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. They have a referral network of um, physicians and counselors who have some experience in counseling people in spiritual emergency. And they're also would be able to uh, say this is beyond spiritual emergency. I think maybe you need to see a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, another uh, place you could uh, refer and look for referral is through the Spiritual Emergence Network. And I don't know where you're located. There's also the International Spiritual Emergence Network and Spiritual Emergence Network in North America and in Canada. They also will give you referrals to healthcare professionals who are experienced in helping people with spiritual emergencies. We also have um, as our SAI affiliated groups, we have some um, of our affiliated groups that also can be helpful. We have Asclepios that is an affiliated group and they're a peer support network for people who are having crises related to their spiritual awakening. So um, that their, their website is listed so uh, they can get some peer support there. And um, then we have Emma Bragdon with the Integrative Mental Health for You and her specialty for many years has been helping people in spiritual emergency. So if you look through our affiliated groups, you'll see a number of them there that are listing spiritual emergency. So, um, so that could be some help. Um, but the, the last thing I want to leave you with is um, even if it is part of a spiritual emergency rather than a mental illness, there's always a risk that someone might get into crisis and might be suicidal. And, and please don't ignore that please help them, uh, refer them to a suicide network. We, we um, had that listed on our spiritual emergency page on the SAI website, how to get in touch with crisis networks in any country around the world. Um, you know, that, that they need professional help if the amount of distress that they're feeling uh, or if the voices are telling them to harm themselves or others, this is a sign that this person, how you can help them best is getting them to some professional help. Okay. I hope that helped. So I've got two more questions that will probably take a good amount of dialogue and that's going to take us to the end of our question and answer period. Uh, so the one I have coming up is from William and he states, I've had frequent ADCs with my past mother about many things, but still struggle with my life purpose being about being and not doing. Any thoughts about what this might mean? a life focused on being, not doing. Thank you, William. Oh, I think it's wonderful that you've had all of these ADCs with your mother. Um, so what a blessing. Hopefully that's been a blessing that you've experienced uh, with her. Um, your question about being versus then doing, I can relate to very directly and I can share from my own personal experience. I, I told everyone the story about how when I had the head injury in 2003, the traumatic brain injury, that I became disabled. That because of my injury, uh, lacerations on my frontal lobes of my brain and the brain hemorrhage in my occipital lobe and whatever trauma in between, I couldn't do what I used to do, <laughs> like I used to do many things that were part of my life being a spiritual person incarnated on the planet. I loved serving. I loved doing things, you know, as simple as I loved being a community mom and I was a community mom to my son's friends. Uh, they, a lot of them call me mom number two. I loved volunteering in my son's school. I loved volunteering in my church. And I was on the, you know, the, the administrative committee of my church. I served on several volunteer boards. You know, I was uh, serving as a doctor, helping patients. I was running the spirituality and healthcare network here in Toronto. And we were having like monthly meetings with speakers and everything like that. So I was doing I was doing things with the university and organizing conferences and traveling and speaking I was on tv and radio so I was doing 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 and I loved it and to me I I thought of service as doing which it is 
to a certain extent. So I was, I was, my life was so busy. I was always doing things. Then all of a sudden I get disabled and I'm not able to do any of those things anymore. None of them. It was like an atomic bomb hit my life and I could look after myself. I could get to rehab and back, but that was really my whole life was doctor's appointments and rehab. And um, I had to uh, come to grips with on an inner level. I mean, that's a whole other story. And I plan to write a book about it in terms of my healing journey from traumatic brain injury and coming to terms with the fact that in the divine plan, I was not going to be healed. And, but I was still a spiritual being. And I perhaps was more spiritual than I'd ever been before because I had been dead and in heaven and seen all my past lives. And I felt very strongly that for whatever reason that I did not understand that I was sent back to serve. And the only way I found that I could serve was through my prayers and meditation. And people would say to me, you know, like my doctors, um, friends, therapists, that Yvonne, you have changed from a spiritual person doing to a spiritual being. And it took me a while to sort of wrap my head around that. But yeah, that being a spiritual being was about my personal relationship with the higher power, what I call God, and my prayers and my meditation and my trying to be a good person and to serve in what any small way I could, which was only in my prayers and meditations. And it was quite amazing to me that people said that to me, you know, that you have become from a person who's spiritually doing that you are now embodying being a spiritual being. So I hope that is helpful to you because, you know, as we all get older, we become less capable of doing, but we do not lose our capacity to be deeply spiritual. And that impacts every, everybody in just small ways all around you. I mean, I've had people say to me, doctors that I, I saw for treatment, that they were moved, that their life was changed by having me as a patient. I went, how is that possible? <laughs> but they said, you're just so spiritual and you just embrace that this is God's plan for you and you trusted it and you, and, and you were so positive despite, you know, everybody else would have been suicidal. And, and um, then I realized, I guess that's true because I was trying to walk my talk you know, that I knew that that God loves each and every one of us. And no matter how bad it looked, I knew this wasn't a punishment that I was disabled. And my love of God did not diminish one iota. In fact, it was stronger after I was disabled. And so just being that is very powerful. So I hope that that story is somewhat helpful to William in understanding what it is to be a spiritual being and to feel strong in that. Um, spiritual doing, yes, we can do that too, but spiritual being is just being genuinely who we are. Thank you, that helps me too. Um, I know William asked a question, but I'm, I'm thinking that helped me too for taking more, giving more value to the quiet time I give myself and I think everybody would benefit. Okay, it's got a one from Gurm, and he states, the idea of past lives implies reincarnation, and yet deathbed visions imply there are souls and or spirits that are not incarnated. Do you think there is a reason as to who ends up where, who reincarnates, and who does not? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, my understanding, Gurm, uh, is... Uh, 
from my study of yoga and also uh, this is what uh, is understood in Buddhism, but I'm also reflecting on my own personal experience is that um, definitely I have incarnated many, 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 many incarnations. And according to yoga and according to Buddha's philosophy, which both incorporate reincarnation, they believe that all souls reincarnate, that all souls reincarnate, just like going to school. You, you don't just go to school for one year. You go in grade one and grade two and then grade three and then grade four. And if you fail math in grade four, you keep doing math in grade four until you pass it and, and so on and so forth. And so that we all have many incarnations. According to Paramahansa Yogananda, the amount of time uh, in terms of how time passes on our earthly frame, because you have to remember time doesn't pass the same on the other side, but in terms of how time passes on our earthly frame, it can be very variable that some people reincarnate right away. Some people may not reincarnate for hundreds of years because there's no time on the other side. I mean, it's very hard for us to understand it. And there may also be, just to put your little looper, there can be overlaps in people's incarnations that people can be incarnated in more than one incarnation at the same time because you know, the divine mystery is so much greater than our understanding. And as far as who we see when we're on the other side, my understanding of that is just that the divine intelligence behind the universe knows who is perfect for, for us to see on the other side at that particular time in our soul journey. Because certainly, I mean, I'll tell you my five near-death experiences, um, I did not see the same beings of light on all of my five near-death experiences. No, I did not. But so why did I see them then? Because I guess, because that was right for me in terms of where I was in my particular soul journey at that particular time. I just, I have absolute trust in the wisdom of the divine plan and that it's, it's, it's a win-win plan. Everybody's gonna win at the end. It's just a matter of how many incarnations we're gonna have to go through to learn all of our soul lessons until finally we get to, they say, become pillars in the temple where we don't have to incarnate anymore, that we have learned all of our soul lessons. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Um, somebody was asking about the resources that you were describing just to let everybody know any of the books you referenced uh, there's more information about them on the SAI website and that is also how you could contact Yvonne for more questions if they come to you later on uh, before we turn this back to Kimberly uh, for closing the session I'm gonna give our vice president just a moment he would like to share something in addition and Yvonne thank you okay Robert you have to unmute yourself Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, Yvonne, that was just a Dr. Kaysen, that was an outstanding presentation. And uh, I just wanted to just have a few closing comments uh, from SAI since we co-sponsored this event with Seattle Lions. Um, please go to our website. Our goal is to bring everybody together. This is why we were created. We're here for everyone. The third Saturday of each month, we offer a free presentation. And um, I think you'll enjoy them. I think you'll enjoy looking at our past presentations. They are posted on the website. We are streaming this also live on Facebook. So we have several followers on Facebook. I was looking at the different countries we were in today. Marshall Islands, Australia, Hong Kong, England. Canada, Spain, and the USA that, that I recognize names. So uh, this is an international event today. And um, thank you to Seattle Lions. But we have a Circle of Honor series that's coming about. It started with Yvonne today, Dr. Kason. But in January, we have Dr. Emma Bragdon, who's going to speak. In February, we're gonna have Dr. Bonnie Greenwell, who's fabulous, especially on 
Kundalini Awakenings. And the following month, we're going to have Dr. Jeffrey Long. All three of those are circle of honor persons that have been designated. It's all free. Please get on our website. Please subscribe. Please sign up for them. And one other thing, we're having a first responders fire police memorial um, presentation. It'll be done by Dr. Richard Kelly. He's a marvelous. And that's going to be in May. And last but not least, last Saturday, we had Dr. Christopher Kerr speak. It was fabulous. Please check out his uh, video. And this one will be posted probably in about two or three days. It takes about two or three days to make it to the website. But thank you very much on behalf of SAI. I'm going to give it to Kimberly. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year and happy holidays from SAI. Thank you. I thank you so much. I want to thank, uh, of course, SAI in particular for making this event free. Uh, free is always good, but at this time when there are economical challenges for many people who are unable to work because of the current pandemic, uh, it's very generous of you uh, to continue making these uh, events free to everyone. It's really important. And thank you so much. And thank you, Yvonne, so much for a lot of information shared in such a tight time period. I look forward to timelessness so that we don't have to go, oh, Zoom meeting's over. You know, I just finally get into it. Uh, because this is a Seattle Lions meeting, we are heart led. I want to, with my whole heart, apologize to some people who are uh, listening to this, who have emailed me through Seattle Ions. Uh, now you know I've been unable to get back to you physically, but I know you're there. And Dirk, if you're still on in particular, I know about your mom Arden's death. Um, for those of you who don't know Dirk and Arden, Dirk is one of our literal heavy lifting volunteers at Seattle Lions, who's attended for decades. Uh, as has his mom, and his mom passed on November 24. We will miss her. We will miss her shiny presence, but I'm not saying she isn't around her. We'll talk, but anyway, uh, I would like to add happy holidays to everyone. Um, I'd like for everyone to concentrate on being healthy, if it is otherwise for you, I truly believe in divine uh, guidance for everything. So whatever we experience in my, in, this is just Kim talking, in, in my experience, not even my belief, my NDE experience is that we get what our soul needs. Perhaps we've even signed up. Uh, I believe so. Uh, but I still wish everyone health uh, especially in such trying pandemic times. Um, and because this is an international event, I would like to quote one of my favorite authors of all time, who happens to be at that time when he was alive out of Britain, uh, Dickens. And to quote one of my favorite characters of one of my favorite authors of all times, Dickens, and that would be Tiny Tim. And at this date on the calendar as we're approaching uh, several holiday situations of people of many faiths, I would like to end by saying, God bless us one and all. Thank you, Thank you for attending. Uh, SeattleIons.org is where you can find out more information. We meet virtually or on the ground every second Saturday. And thank you again, SAI, Bob Bear, Linda Truax, and Dr. Yvonne Kaysen. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>